very few weapons appear in both Half-Life 1 and 2. One of those is a weapon which in Half-Life 2 is called the Tau Cannon, but in Half-Life 1 was called the Gauss Gun. Sometimes, despite not being one. But we'll get to that. The Tau Cannon is possibly the least well-understood weapon in Half-Life. Most people seem unaware of what its name even is, how to use it, and what it can do. In some parts of Half-Life 1, the weapon is referred to as the Gauss Gun, the most obvious being the weapon's class name, Weapon Gauss. Gauss guns are an actual thing. They are guns that propel a projectile not via combustion, but electromagnetism. Much like our Gauss gun, they are still in the experimental phase. At some point in development, the HEV suit would announce weapons as they're picked up, and its description of the Gauss gun is consistent with an actual Gauss gun. This voice line can still be found in the files of the retail game. Experimental hypervelocity projectile weapon. A reminder that unused content is not necessarily canon. There are other parts of Half-Life 1 that do refer to it as the Tau Cannon. In multiplayer, for instance, when a player is killed by the Tau Cannon, special code is activated to report the weapon used as being the Tau Cannon instead of the Gauss Gun. It would seem like the Tau Cannon was originally a true Gauss Gun, but it was changed for some unknown reason. If the weapon's concept changed so drastically, it's prudent to ask why the old name is still partially used. I think this is because Valve didn't have a good way to change the class names of the weapon and ammo entities without recompiling every map that had either entity on it. Back then, compiling a Half-Life map took an amount of time worth caring about. Some have said that the gun actually still is electromagnetic, as opposed to the gluon gun and displacer cannon which surely use the depleted uranium as an energy source, the Tau cannon is firing it as a projectile. Depleted uranium does actually have applications as high-powered ammunition. This is said to explain the way that the beam is capable of ricocheting off of things. The idea definitely opens up more questions than it answers. Why change the weapon's name if it actually was accurate? The part of the gun which would apparently be the barrel does not have a hole. If the Tau Cannon really is just firing a bullet, then it's pretty inefficient. Though, to be fair, that's true of real-life Gauss guns, too. If the gun is essentially firing a bullet, why does it look like a beam? Technical reasons does not seem like a likely story. How does depleted uranium penetrate walls? So while I was editing, I realized that the gun can use multiple pieces of ammo for a single shot, and yeah, I'm not even taking this idea seriously anymore. I think it's much easier to believe what appears to be implied by the name Tau Cannon. It shoots a beam of Tau particles. If you're like me and didn't realize that a Gauss gun is an actual thing, then you probably concluded what I initially did. It's a directed energy weapon that was named after Carl Frederick Gauss. Fuck. A physicist who lived from 1777 to 1855. Presumably his work would have somehow been involved in the making of the Gauss gun. Something which he himself might not have wished for. The weapon is first acquired in the chapter Questionable Ethics. When people talk about the ethics, they usually refer to what Black Mesa was doing to the Xenian wildlife in this chapter, but I think the name is also in reference to this weapon. Directed energy weapons are real, and they are already as powerful as they have any business being. In case you were wondering if a beam of Tau particles could actually cause severe instant damage, the answer is quite possibly yes, though it seems like no one has ever tried that with Tau particles specifically. A great question is, how does the ammunition work? Let's ignore the whole fact that this gun somehow gets Tau particles out of depleted uranium and just ask how it even gets it in there. Since the gun never needs to be reloaded, we never learn how it's fed uranium. The exact nature of the depleted uranium is a mystery for all three weapons that use the ammunition as none of them reload and the ammo is apparently never depicted outside of its box. It's interesting that both the Tau Cannon and the Displacer Cannon have a rotating part, and while the Gluon Gun doesn't have any moving parts, its beam does have this helix thing going on. Does this mean that rotation is somehow important? I don't know. I do have to wonder if Valve knew what depleted uranium actually is. It's a biohazard, but not a particularly interesting material. An unseen scientist describes the gun as a prototype. Put that down. It's a prototype. An identical copy of the gun exists in LambdaCore. It's in LambdaCore where we find the gluon gun. Given that this room has a small firing range, it's probably near wherever weapons research was in Black Mesa. 
The tau can was probably made by those same scientists, so what was it doing in biological research labs? I suppose it's related to this laser experiment, but why was that there either? The beam is capable of reflecting off surfaces if it impacts at a sufficiently shallow angle. I'm not aware of any locations in the game where you can put this to good use in regular gameplay. Sure, there are some places where you can conceivably kill an enemy with a bouncing beam, but is it really any better than directly shooting them? The obvious use case would be to hit an enemy while you are completely behind cover. Thing is, enemies don't just sit there when you take cover, they usually pursue you. Even barring that, you need some very good spatial awareness to even realize that hitting a reflected beam is even an option. The range of angles that a beam can be at when reflecting off a wall is not very large. A single reflection of a beam can cause the beam to lose up to half of its damage, so to actually do any significant damage you would have to use a charged shot, and that means risking a lot of ammo. The secondary fire, should you realize it exists, will charge up to fire a more powerful shot that is released when the trigger is. Charged shots are capable of penetrating through surfaces. The gun's ability to penetrate walls is quite possibly the least clear mechanic Valve has ever put into any game. The only hint of this ability in Half-Life 1 is the scene that introduces the gun. Put that down. Get the prototype. A beam can be seen going through a wall and destroying boxes. While that's great, I never knew that beam was there until I actually trained my eyes on that specific spot and looked for it. The beam is very thin and only seen for a brief moment, and I doubt most people even noticed it. Even if you do notice it, I think you could plausibly mistake it as having come through a crack in these machines anyway. In Half-Life 1, there's no visual indication of penetration at all when you fire the gun, other than damaging whatever is on the other side of the wall. There are hardly any good areas to utilize the gun's penetration ability. The quirk of the gun which people are probably the most familiar with is its recoil. A charge shot will push the user back in the opposite direction of which the gun was fired. It may seem inconsequential at first, but when used to its full potential, it's an effective movement tool, and one that doesn't require damage. In single player, the gun is only capable of pushing the player horizontally. The vertical component of the force is simply removed, leaving the horizontal component alone to be however small it is. This means that to get the best force, you should point the gun at eye level, a trait which is shared with the long jump module. Now that we've looked at the broad strokes of the mechanics, let's look at them in detail. We will discuss the gun as it pertains to Half-Life 1, Half-Life Source, and then Half-Life 2. A beam is fired once every 0.2 seconds when holding down the primary fire button, upon letting go of the secondary fire button, or upon running out of ammo while charging up a shot. A charged shot must be charged for at least half a second. If the secondary fire button is released before then, the gun will still charge involuntarily until it is charged for half a second. It's actually slightly more than that, but for basically all purposes, you can regard it as being exactly half a second. A charge shot takes 4 seconds to fully charge in single player, and 1.5 and seconds in multiplayer. Once a charge reaches this point, there is no benefit to holding on to it for any longer. If a charge is held for longer than 10 seconds, the charge will end and will backfire on the player, dealing 50 shock damage. The primary fire always does 20 points of damage. The secondary fire will do 200 damage if fully charged. At the minimum charge of half a second, it will do 25 damage in single player and 66.6 .6 repeating in multiplayer, since it takes less time to get to a full charge in multiplayer. The damage done by a charged shot can be calculated with this formula. X is the duration of the charge, and Y is the maximum charge time. The primary fire interval applies only to the primary fire. You can begin charging immediately after firing a primary shot, and either mode can be used immediately after firing a secondary shot. The damage per second of the primary fire is 100. No matter how long you charge it for, and assuming your input timing is optimal, the secondary fire DPS is 50 for single player and 133.3 repeating in multiplayer. When put this way, it looks like the primary fire is clearly superior in single player, but we haven't yet mentioned cover. The Tau can can be charged up while in cover. Consider an HECU grunt at full health, 80 on hard. With the primary fire, it would take 4 hits to kill, or 0.6 seconds. The 0.2 delay on the final shot wouldn't matter because the enemy would already be dead. The entire time, you would be exposed. Side note, getting a little damage early can be good because it can, in some cases, temporarily stun enemies or make them reconsider their tactics. With the secondary fire, you can charge behind cover for 1.6 seconds, and assuming you have a good fix on where the enemy is, you can come out of cover and kill him before he even has time to react. 
If the enemy has moved out of sight since you last saw him, you can still hold on to the charge for 8.4 more seconds. During that time, you should go look for a target. There is no benefit ever to letting the gun overcharge. If you lose your target, you should always fire onto a wall that you think the enemy is behind. In the case that an enemy catches you off guard, the primary fire is definitely the way to go. In multiplayer, you can get 3 primary hits off for 60 damage before getting 1 secondary hit for 66.6 .6 repeating. If an enemy has 80 health, the primary and secondary modes would take equally long to kill. Above that, it would be faster to use the secondary fire, and it is obviously a likely case that enemy players will be above 80 health, or have at least decent armor. It should also be said though that the primary fire is much more forgiving if you miss due to its fire rate. Now on to ammo. You can carry 100 pieces of ammo at a time. Consider we have a very strong target who will tank many hundreds of damage. How do we use the Tau Cannon for all it's worth? The primary fire uses 2 ammo per shot. If you only have 1 ammo left, then you can only use the secondary fire. The secondary fire uses at least 1 ammo in up to 13 in single player and 11 in multiplayer. Similar to damage, the amount of ammo used increases with charge time. When charging, the gun will consume 1 ammo every 0.3 seconds in single player and 0.1 seconds in multiplayer until the shot is fully charged. During the initial mandatory half second of a charge, only one piece of ammo will be used, and then 12 over the next 3.5 seconds in single player and 10 over the next second in multiplayer. It helps to look at these numbers in ammo per second. The primary fire uses 10 ammo per second. The initial half second of the secondary charge uses 2 ammo per second. The voluntary portion of the charge uses approximately 3.4 ammo per second in single player and 10 ammo per second in multiplayer. If we consider both parts of the charge together, it's 3.25 ammo per second in single player and 7.3 repeating ammo per second in multiplayer. When trying to conserve ammo, you want this number to be as low as possible. Remember, damage increases linearly with charge time, not the amount of ammo used. The initial half second of charging consumes less ammo per second than the rest of the charge. In terms of ammo efficiency, half second charges are clearly superior in single and multiplayer. The gluon gun and displacer cannon also draw from the same ammo source, so we must also ask how the tau cannon compares to them if we really want to be ammo efficient. The gluon gun uses 1 ammo to deal 14 damage. This is less efficient. The displacer cannon's primary fire uses 20 ammo to do enough damage to neutralize anything on a direct hit that isn't programmed to not die by regular means. This means it cannot kill things like the Nihilanth or Gonarch, but everything else is instant. A Voltagore, the strongest regular enemy in the game, has 450 health on hard, so we can say 20 ammo is worth 450 damage or 1 ammo is worth 22.5 damage. Still just a bit behind the Tau Cannon. The only exception is apparently the Gargantua. A Displacer Cannon hit will do 250 damage to it, plus 20 or so in area of effect damage as the projectile approaches the NPC, or if it hits in the head, 750 plus another 20-ish from AoE. The AoE is very inconsistent and is small enough to be ignored. By comparison, the Tau Cannon can't even hurt Gargantuas. The Gluon Gun can though, and it can also headshot them, so that's interesting. 750 damage from 20 ammo, or 37.5 damage per ammo, is a major efficiency improvement, and it actually is possible to execute an opposing force. A single time. And there's already a far easier way to kill that Gargantua that doesn't involve using any ammo, so headshotting it with the Displacer Cannon is actually just wasteful. In conclusion, the Tau Cannon wins. Ammo efficiency is usually not this important. I can't really think of a reason to conserve ammo so aggressively outside of some kind of challenge run. Movement. As mentioned before, the secondary fire's recoil can push the user backwards in the direction opposite the gun was fired in. This is referred to as gauze boosting and is commonly done both in speedrunning and deathmatch to reach places faster. It is occasionally useful in casual play as well. The amount of force generated is based directly off the damage that the shot would do if it hit a target. The amount of force done is the damage times 5. This is applied directly to the player's current velocity, which is represented as units per second. If you're not familiar with how much a unit is in Half-Life, it's comparable to an inch. The default running speed is 320 units per second. A half second charge, which is one piece of ammo, does 25 damage in single player and so would give 125 units per second of backward speed. A full charge does 200 damage and yields 1000 units per second in speed. Let's imagine you want to cross a long obstacle free area and you don't care about ammo. If possible, it would be optimal to have already been charging up a shot to full strength before entering the area. Here is an example. There is no way faster to break this door than to shoot it twice with this gun. 
while shooting the door, the Tau cannon is being charged. By the time the door is down, the charge is full and is fired as soon as the runner is in position to boost. This is 4 seconds faster than waiting, well, 4 seconds, to charge the gun after getting in position. Let's remember that the damage, and therefore the backwards force, scales linearly with the time spent charging, and it doesn't matter how long you charge, the time spent charging is always rewarded with speed at the same rate. A single full charge shot gives the same force as 8 half second charges, but the half second charges are better. Let's say we want to travel 10,000 units, which is about this far. Again, no obstacles or anything else, and we'll assume you're coming in with 1,000 UPS from a pre-prepared shot. If you just bunny hop to the end, you'll get there in 10 seconds. If you do full charge shots along the way, however, you can gain extra speed. At the 4 second mark, you could have a full charge shot ready to gain an additional 1000 UPS which would mean you'd cover the remaining 6,000 units in 3 seconds, which wouldn't even be enough time to get another full charge. This would take 7 seconds to do. What if we do half second charges? I won't bore you with all of the details, but the gist is that because we start accelerating sooner, we can go faster for longer. So it would take 5.9 seconds to travel 10,000 units with the half second charge strategy, as opposed to 7 with the full charge strategy, and 10 seconds without doing any additional charge shots. Speedrunners currently do very little half-second charging. A few obvious candidate locations for it do exist. The Tau Cannon shoots a beam that can harm some personnel. First, all of the important code related to the beam is run inside a loop. The loop runs when the damage of the beam is above 10 and when a variable called max hits is above 0. Both of these conditions must be true for the loop to run. It may seem weird to check that the beam's damage is above 10, but as you'll see, the beam's damage can be reduced over time. Every iteration, the beam will either reflect off a surface, penetrate a surface, pierce through an object, or stop. Max hits is an integer that starts at 10. It is decremented by 1 every time the loop runs. This means a beam can only reflect, pierce, and or penetrate up to 10 times. The beam finds a target by drawing an invisible line in the direction that the user is looking. This is the same basic way that many things are done, like finding what a bullet hit or finding if an NPC can see an enemy. When the line hits something, if that thing is damageable, it will apply damage to that thing. The damage type is bullet. In contrast, the gluon gun's damage type is energy beam, which is why it can hurt gargantuas. It's important to know that, even if it may not appear to be the case, all line traces that start inside solid material will travel through the material until they encounter empty space for the first time. Lines that touch the outside void, though, seem to always report that they're inside solid material, even if they enter back into the boundaries of the map. It is sometimes hard to know for sure what things are solid all the way through and what things have void in them, but you can make an educated guess if you know how BSP maps are generally made. Whenever I say empty space, it will refer to space inside the map that players and other objects were intended to exist within, including water and grating. The void, on the other hand, is the space outside the map which nothing is meant to touch. The next part of the code looks at what was hit to see if it's something that a beam is able to reflect off of. An object can have a beam reflected off it if it is not damageable and it's made of map geometry. Basically, all the boring stuff. Although it may sometimes look as though a beam is reflecting off an object that doesn't fit these criteria, like this box which is in fact damageable, this is only a visual bug and no damage will happen along the apparent beam path. The requirement of being damageable is not specific to the Tau Cannon. If there is any theoretical source of damage that could hurt the entity, then it's considered damageable. Conversely, objects that don't pass the reflectability requirement are things that are damageable or otherwise using a high-quality model. In other words, NPCs and breakable things. In the case that the beam hits a non-reflectable object, it will do a simplistic penetration behavior which we'll refer to as piercing. When the beam pierces something, it simply travels through the object to the other side with no loss in damage or explosion. The beam will remember the most recently pierced object and ignore it during the next iteration of the beam. The player is considered the pierced object when a beam first begins looping so that the player won't hit themselves, because the line technically starts at the player's camera. What if the player wasn't remembered as the pierced entity? Even though the line would exit out of the player, it would register the player as something that it hit. Bullets work the same way. Naturally, I must now answer the question, what happens when a line hits two things? A line can actually only remember that it's hit one thing. 
Testing would show that lines will always remember the entity that they hit second, unless that entity is the world, which put shortly means static stuff like walls, in which case it will choose to remember the first entity that was hit instead. If the hit object is reflectable, the most complex behavior is seen. If the code was remembering a recently pierced entity, it will forget it. This will become very important later, but for now, the code looks at how the beam hit the surface it landed on. It does this using a dot product, which is a mathematical operation that tells the difference between two different directions that are being represented as vectors. The result of the operation is a single number, with a larger number indicating a larger difference. The two directions being looked at are basically what you'd expect. The direction the beam was going at, and the direction that's perpendicular to the surface and facing toward it. For our purposes, the resulting number will be something between 0 and 1. A number closer to 0 means that the beam was closer to parallel to the surface, and a number closer to 1 means that the beam was closer to perpendicular to the surface. If the dot product's result, n, is less than 0 0.5, the beam will reflect. 0 0.5 translates to approximately 30 degrees away from being parallel. The beam will reflect like a beam of light would upon hitting a mirror. A strange quirk is that the reflected beam does not start at the point of impact, but rather 8 units ahead in the direction of the reflected beam. Remember that all line traces that start inside solid material will keep traveling through that material freely until they touch empty space for the first time. This means that if you aim a beam towards an inward corner, you can make that reflected beam segment go through an obstruction of any size unimpeded. That beam segment will not be visible unless the beam itself starts in empty space, which means to see the beam, the obstruction has to be less than 8 units thick. This has led people to believe that this trick, called reflection bypassing, is much more niche than it really is. I would say that it's still niche, but more applicable than people think. Due to the visual inconsistency this creates, expect all subsequent beam segments to appear incorrectly, similar to the bug mentioned previously. While not very useful, it is amusing that beams can reflect off the sky. At the point of impact when reflecting, an invisible explosion is created. The damage of the explosion is equal to the damage times n, so being more towards perpendicular means more damage. The radius of the explosion is the explosion's final damage times 2.5, which is typical for explosions. The explosion's damage type is blast, which is typical for explosions as well. This explosion is not very reliable as an attack. Attempting to utilize it directly with the optimal angle will give you a 100 damage blast with a radius of 250, which is really not worth it considering the damage you risk to yourself. Attempting to use the explosion for propelling yourself is also not particularly good, but it can grant enough height to make a difference in some cases. The height gained is only the amount that would also be expected from a conventional explosive that dealt the same amount of damage, but the difference is that a reflection boost is done at the same time as a gauss boost, so it's easier and quicker to set up than attempting to use a grenade boost at the same time as a gauss boost. When an object near a wall or floor is pierced, a reflective explosion can end up being very close to it. In this case, the explosion is being placed underneath the box. The initial beam, the explosion, and the reflected beam all hurt the object separately, though the math will usually work out to exactly double the damage of the initial beam. Finally, all reflections end with the beam losing some of its energy, which means damage. The damage of the beam on the next iteration of the loop will be the damage times 1 minus n, which means impact angles closer to parallel will take away less damage, and angles closer to perpendicular will take away more, for a maximum of half the damage lost in one reflection. n being larger means stronger explosions, but less damage being available for future beam segments. If the beam does not reflect, which means it's 60 or less degrees away from hitting the surface perpendicularly, the beam will instead attempt to penetrate through the surface. First, the beam checks to see if it's already done this more complex penetration behavior before. If it has, then the beam will end there as it refuses to penetrate again and there is no chance of reflection or piercing. Then the code checks that the beam is not a primary fire beam. If it is, then the beam stops. A second line is then traced starting 8 units past the point of impact to a point 8192 units past the point of impact to see if there is space on the other side of the wall. For simplicity's sake, I will use the word wall, but the beam can in fact go through floors, ceilings, or anything else. Remember that if a line ever touches the void, it counts itself as inside solid material forever, even if there is valid space past the void. If the entire second line is inside solid material, then the beam ends. The place the second line stops at is not of interest. All that matters is that it eventually found empty space. If it does find empty space, a third line is traced from where the second line stopped to the beam's point of impact. 
The distance between where the third line stops and the beam's point of impact represents the thickness in units that the beam needs to penetrate, which we'll call M. If M is less than the beam's damage, the shot can penetrate. When penetrating, the damage amount will first have M subtracted from it. A 200 damage beam could therefore penetrate a 100 unit thick wall and still have a damage of 100, which is actually pretty strong. At the place where the third line stops and 8 units in the direction of the beam, another invisible explosion is created. Its damage is equal to the beam's damage, and its radius is its damage times 2.5 in single player and 1.75 in multiplayer. Its damage type is again blast. In the next iteration of the beam loop, the beam will start at the place where the third line stopped and, as always, damage whatever is in its way. The invisible explosion gives the user some leeway in where they can aim. If their target is behind a wall and they're standing near the wall, the user will do a fraction of the full damage if they hit close, but if they do hit their target, then they can do nearly double the damage which would have been done had the target not been behind the wall. A cruel joke considering that they were probably looking to avoid damage. A beam can continue to reflect or pierce after penetrating. As mentioned before, the second line starts 8 units past the point of impact. This could lead to it skipping over a very thin gap, which is definitely convenient. Similarly, the penetration explosion starts 8 units away from the far side of the wall, so it can spawn inside something, which will cause the damage to not decrease with distance. This is a process which some have dubbed nuking. Here are some nukes that you do and don't know. A very long portion of this video is dedicated to just covering bugs. I know we already talked about nuking and reflection bypassing, but no no no, this is the section about bugs. Some places have been found where the second line will act as if it encountered void when that shouldn't be possible. Take these boxes. This way, the boxes cannot be penetrated. The boxes are 160 units thick, so a full charge shot should be able to go through. The same is true on the other side. Yet, when hitting from the left or right, they can be penetrated. The top boxes can be penetrated from any side. Here are some other boxes on the same map with the same thickness, which can be penetrated. I have no idea how to explain this. If you start a secondary charge while only having one piece of ammo left and hold down the trigger for the entire time, it will take away one more piece of ammo than should be possible, leaving you at negative one ammo. The next time you pick up Goss ammo, you'll notice that you get 19 instead of 20. The reason this happens is because the code takes away the ammo before it checks to see if it's time to force the shot. A self-goss is when a beam erroneously hits the most recently pierced entity, which is usually the player, hence the name. Recently, there was a patch that nerfed self-gossing, so this could be interpreted as Valve making self-gossing into a feature. However, the wording of the patch reveals that they don't actually understand how self-gossing happens. Beam reflections play no role in self-gossing. Theoretically, yes, you could have a beam redirect in such a way that it ended up hitting you, but the conditions needed for that are extremely rare. I doubt it's ever happened to anyone on accident in 25 years. I tried for several hours to find a setup in any valve map and could not. Theoretically, you could do it on this curve here, but the angles just don't work out quite right. Let's quickly recap every requirement for penetrating a wall. Hitting a reflectable object, hitting at an acceptable angle, not having penetrated already, not using primary fire, having space on the other side of the wall, and having enough damage to overcome the thickness of the wall. A self goss happens when all these requirements are met, except damage. If you fire a half second charge at basically anything with space behind it, you'll probably do a self goss. The reason this happens is because the code reacts differently when failing the damage check. When all other requirements fail, the beam will immediately stop forever, but the damage check will allow the beam to keep iterating when it fails. Since the beam didn't penetrate, the variables for damage and starting position of the beam have not been changed, but since the beam hit a reflectable object, the most recently pierced entity has been forgotten, and that is the only difference. The next beam segment starts where the last one did. Because the damage hits the same place that it came from, the force ends up being pointed straight up. As with reflection boosting, the damage is not any more than an explosive could do, but it is faster and easier in some scenarios. The player entity is always playing one animation or another. 
A self goss can have different effects depending on how the hitboxes are positioned when firing and the angle the beam was fired at. This can even matter when standing still because the player's idle animation has them doing whatever this is. Usually the self goss beam will be very short, only hitting the player in the back of the neck or head. If you jump and crouch at the right time, you can dodge the beam entirely, leaving whatever is in the way to be hit instead. This is not necessary to transfer a self goss onto another entity, more on that later, but if you were to miss, it would mean you don't suffer any damage. The December 22 patch made it so that self gosses cannot headshot you, but I will still be talking about this part of the bug because it still applies to all versions of the game that are used in speedrunning and high level deathmatch. To record this part, I am using a backup I made of the December 12th patch. As with most other attacks, a self goss can do triple the damage if it hits your head, while using the exact same amount of ammo and time spent charging as a body shot. Shooting yourself in the head is just efficient. In the later parts of the game, there is the infinite health door, a door that can be used to give yourself as much health as you want. A full charge self goss can deal 600 damage, and if you have the health to survive it, it looks like this. Taking more damage from a self goss necessitates having a thicker wall to hit, so while 25 damage self gosses are quite common, ones that actually give any significant height are more rare. Of course, the definition of significant is context sensitive. As with all damage based boosts, your HEV suit is working against you because damage absorbed by the HEV suit imparts no force. As mentioned, the entity that gets self gossed is usually the player, but not always. If another entity is pierced first, that entity will get self gossed instead. This would be that entity's second time taking the damage since it was already hit and pierced once. If a reflection happens right before the beam hits a place where it would self goss the erroneous beam will exist only in empty space and won't cause anything to happen. Whenever a beam segment starts inside a non-world entity which it isn't remembering as the pierced entity, that beam will pierce or reflect if it lands on the world. Remember that the world is deprioritized when choosing which of two entities to remember as being hit. To make this easier to understand, I recreated the beam in Half-Life 2 Chaos where I could visualize the path. If the entity that the beam started inside was pierceable, then the beam will pierce. The piercing code was written under the assumption that the beam's ending position was somewhere on the surface of the hit entity. The piercing code was also written so that the next beam segment will start one unit past the point of impact. Just like reflection bypassing, the beam will pass through the world with no loss in damage. This can also be accomplished with self-gossing, either on an entity or yourself. Doing this with the player is a bit tricky because the hitboxes won't always be where they need to be. If the entity that the beam started inside was reflectable, then the beam will reflect instead. The starting position of the next beam will, as always when reflecting, be 8 units past the point of impact. In this case, n will be 0, so the beam's direction won't change at all and the explosion will do nothing. After the explosion and before the damage reduction, the code will check to see if n is 0, and if it is, it'll set it to be 0.1 instead, so the beam will lose 1 tenth of its damage. Funk pushable can generate behavior not seen anywhere else. When a funk pushable breaks, the entity still exists and is solid until the end of the frame. During that brief time, any line traces will treat the entity like it's still there. Coincidentally, when breaking, the entity also becomes undamageable, meaning it becomes reflectable. Here is a beam reflecting off a funk pushable. And now here's a beam penetrating a funk pushable. This is even weirder. The shot first breaks the box. Remember that the damage is done first, then the beam decides if it will pierce, penetrate, reflect, or stop. The beam sees that it hit a reflectable entity and tries to penetrate it. For some reason, the third line will not stop at the other side of the box, but back on the front side, in the exact same spot that the beam first hit. Remember that the distance between the place the beam hit and the place the third line hits is assumed to represent the thickness of the wall. In this case, the thickness will come back as zero. A programmer at Valve predicted that m could somehow be zero, so in the case of m being zero, it will be set to one. The explosion will do full damage minus one. The beam will then continue through the box with almost no damage lost. When attempting to find a penetration bypass, I instead found the penetration backfire. You will need a wall of any thickness with space behind it and a separate obstruction behind the wall. You have to fire a charged shot into the wall. The damage of the shot is not important. The beam will attempt to penetrate. Okay, so you know how I've been saying that line traces that start inside solid material will keep going through the solid material until they encounter empty space for the first time? Well, there's a bit of a caveat. 
the second line will find the entity and stop right where the entity and the wall meet. The third line will go from that same point and somehow stop at the edge of the wall, the same place the beam originally hit. As we saw before, n will be artificially set to 1 if it is 0. The ending position of the third line is assumed to represent where the wall ends, so the explosion will be placed 8 units past it. The explosion will of course nuke and do full damage minus 1. The beam will then continue through the wall with almost no damage lost. A bug exists in later versions of the game that throws all my talk about efficiency straight into the trash. To explain quick goss, we have to talk about time. Half-Life keeps track of time by counting the seconds since the map started. There are plenty of terms for this and I'm going to call it the global time. One way to know how long ago something happened is to store in a variable what the global time was when the event happened. This is how the game keeps track of how long you've been charging a shot, by storing what time it was when the charge began. This variable is not stored in saves, however, so when a save is loaded, this is always set to zero. If the global time is above 4, which is basically always, then the conditions exist to fire a full charge shot. The only thing left is to tell the gun it's time to fire. To do that, simply start a half second charge and make the save before it releases. Don't hold down the secondary fire when loading the save, though, because this may cause you to hit the code that checks if you've been charging for 10 seconds and zaps you. This entire process consumes only one ammo, but has all the benefits of a full charge. The variable that tells when the primary is available to be fired again after being fired once is in a similar situation. It too is set back to zero upon loading a save. This was something done unwittingly by a programmer who didn't realize how their code would affect the Gauss gun specifically. While loading a save does take time, usually more than 0.2 seconds, this allows you to fire the gun faster from the perspective of the game, and it's in-game time that speedrunners use. The Gauss gun is used mainly for boosting in speedruns. There aren't even that many enemies left to kill by the time you pick it up, and even then, the secondary fire is preferred for its ammo efficiency, burst fire, and penetration ability. There's really only one place where the primary fire gets to shine, destroying the Nihilanth's crystals. Though it is ammo inefficient, its 100 DPS is the best available at that time. The Gluon Gun's DPS is 140, but it cannot reach the crystals from the ground and, long story short, it probably would not be a good idea to use a jump pad just to hit the crystals. So then why don't they do this trick in the speedrun? The speedrun.com leaderboards have two major categories, WAN and STEAM. WAN does not have this trick, so we need to look at a STEAM run instead. Really? Why quick goss? Why not do the rapid fire trick? Well, it turns out it's banned, even in scripted categories. Why? I don't really know. But what if it wasn't banned? Well, 300 damage needs to be done across three different crystals which each have 100 health. With the standard primary fire it will take 2.8 seconds, not accounting for the time it takes to reposition the mouse between each crystal. The DPS of quick gossing is 400, so theoretically it should be able to destroy all three crystals in under a second, but practically no. There is a half second delay between pressing the secondary trigger and the gun firing, so each shot takes at least half a second, and it takes one and a half seconds to destroy all three crystals with quick goss shots. Also, each crystal only needs half of a full charge shot to break, so the DPS is effectively only 200. With the rapid fire trick, your refire interval is your frame time. You can expend all of your ammo, equivalent to a thousand damage, in one second. To more clearly demonstrate this, I have modified the gun so that it's not necessary to save load. Now let's talk about all the same things again in Half-Life Source. Most of the differences don't originate from the weapon itself, but rather the things surrounding it. The existence of penetration as a mechanic has been hinted at more strongly, but it's still not exactly great. The beam's damage type was changed to energy beam, which means it can now hurt gargantuas. The visual portion of the beam now originates in server code instead of client code, and is done in the same code as everything else, so there are no visual inconsistencies. Reflected beams no longer start 8 units ahead in their direction of travel, so reflection bypassing is no longer possible. In Source, explosions that spawn inside the world cannot hit anything, so some tricks have been nerfed. It would seem that Funk Pushable no longer becomes undamageable upon breaking, so any tricks related to that are not present in Half-Life Source. 
The primary fire does 40 damage in multiplayer, therefore its DPS is 200. There is no threshold of health at which it would be quicker to kill an enemy with the secondary fire. With the primary fire, one piece of ammo is worth 20 damage. Half second charges still maintain the lead at 25 damage per ammo. The backfire from overcharging the gun is now crush as well as shock damage. The rationale was apparently that adding crush damage would prevent the damage from pushing the player because in Half-Life Source, shock damage can push you. How logical. Despite Valve's best efforts, the damage does still push you slightly. In the Source engine, line traces regard the void as empty space. Self-gossing is much, much more common. In fact, it's easy to do by mistake. The player model doesn't animate as much, but it does do this. There seems to be only a very small range where you can hit headshot self-gosses. Headshots to the player also now only do double damage instead of triple. It is also much more likely that the beam will miss you entirely. Ducking while jumping will massively displace the player model, so it's much easier to dodge a self-goss if you wish to. The infinite health door has no effect on you, so you cannot survive a self-goss over 99 damage. Line traces that start inside the world will still bore their way out of the solid material, but seem to only be able to hit the world. This means that the second line used in the thickness calculation will almost always go through non-world entities, but the third line will stop upon hitting them. You can now penetrate these boxes, unless you're aiming in the path of this NPC. It is now considered part of the wall. For the same reason, the penetration backfire does not exist. self goss bypassing does not seem to be possible in Source. The erroneous beam segment will either stop instantly, or it goes in the opposite direction and stops before leaving the orange hitbox. Both make no sense. I have not found any side effects of this. Quick goss does not exist in Half-Life Source. Rapid fire does. One notable feature of the Source engine is displacements. These are thin meshes of geometry that can create much more convincing terrain than what you can get with the older brushes. Displacements appear in Half-Life Source, though only rarely. These are the only ones I am aware of. Displacements seem to have some unique ways of working. Most notably, they are only solid from one side for the purpose of line traces. What happens if you try to penetrate a displacement? I think most people would observe that displacements appear to be infinitely thin, and assume they are also physically infinitely thin, as I did. Apparently, that is not so. The second line will be stopped instantly despite being below the surface of the displacement. Lines that have no length are being represented as small vertical lines so that you can still see them. The third line can go through the displacement unimpeded, so M will come back as zero. The explosion spawns below the displacement and will hit things through the backside. The next beam segment will start one unit past the surface and also be instantly stopped. There is an alternate case where the second line will start cleanly past the displacement, but the differences are trivial. Here's an interesting scenario. The beam penetrates the rock, but then is trapped between the rock and the displacement. The beam will keep reflecting until either the damage falls below 10 or max hits is reached. Suppose there was an enemy right next to the spot. Will we want N to be high, creating strong explosions that weaken quickly, or low, creating weaker explosions that survive for more hits? Actually, neither are that good. The best shot I was able to find did 390 in explosion damage, and N started at a moderate 0.3. However, because the planes of the rock and displacement are not perfectly parallel, N slowly rose over time to 0.4. The important thing to remember is that the penetration of the rock uses its own rules for how its explosion works and how it reduces damage. An interesting case that's right next to this spot is when the beam does actually bypass the displacement and later re-emerges from the ground. For the sake of my own sanity, I am pleased to report that the gun was completely rewritten in Half-Life 2 and was massively simplified. Alex finally canonizes the gun's name when she mentions it. Obviously, the gun is now attached to the buggy and features a different design, perhaps a bit more fitting with Half-Life 2's art direction. The gun fires a beam and something that looks more like a projectile. I don't really know what to make of this. Like with all bullets except sniper rounds, this isn't a real projectile and you don't need to aim ahead. Nothing about the new design indicates anything about how the gun works, though the spinning thingy was retained. Good. If you entered the buggy while its engine was not stalled in water, you can fire the gun underwater. If you enter the vehicle while it's already in water, then the gun won't work. 
Notice that the gun itself can be above water and still not work. If you exit water while in the buggy, all of the vehicle's functions will immediately begin working again. This shows to me that the Tau Cannon pulls its energy from the buggy, and being able to fire it underwater in this case is a bug. The Half-Life 2 Tau Cannon plays no role in speedrunning or deathmatch. Not in speedrunning because you don't even take the buggy, and not in deathmatch because the buggy doesn't even exist in Half-Life 2 deathmatch. While still not even coming close to conveying the penetration mechanic in a useful way, it seems like Valve was thinking more about it. The secondary fire will leave a red decal on both sides of the spot it hits, suggesting that the shot is more powerful and has some kind of molecular effect on the wall. The only other time this texture is seen is from Stalker Laser Beams. The name of the texture implies that it would fade away over time, leaving just a regular bullet decal behind. This doesn't actually happen though, and that's likely for the best, as it makes it just slightly more apparent what the secondary fire does. There are several good wallbang spots, but if you don't know where the enemies are, you'll just have to fire at random spots and hope you hit. The enemies don't seem to prefer staying indoors either, so the opportunities are still limited. Some files and code indicate that the gun was at some point going to be removed from the buggy and given to the player as a holdable weapon, an entity which is no longer present anywhere in code but is in Half-Life 2.fgd would have managed the removal. An output on NPC Vortigaunt that also no longer exists in code would have fired when the removal was finished. The Jeep has two related inputs. One moves the gun off the Jeep. The other hides and disables the gun. A console variable exists which indicates the player could have carried up to 30 pieces of ammo at a time. In closed caption English.txt, which stores English subtitles, we can see some entries that are related to the Tau Cannon. One named Barn Get Tau Off is just a single space. We'll get that weapon off the car for you, but you're going to have to continue on foot. We'll get that weapon off the car for you, but you're going to have to continue on foot. An entire set which would have been said by a Vortigaunt. The Freeman will accept this weapon, or suffer greatly on the road ahead. The Freeman must not proceed without the Tau Particle Cannon. Another empty one. This Tau Cannon once killed many of our kind. Use it wisely. Some entries in Level Sounds Coast.txt also mention the Tau Cannon. Two entries of Alex saying something about the Tau Cannon or maybe just the buggy in general. Apparently, Noriko commenting that the Tau Cannon is good. The beam cannot pierce or reflect off surfaces. The beam can penetrate, though it is simplified. Charged shots will attempt to penetrate regardless of the angle of impact. The recoil of the charged shot still exists, but is applied to the buggy instead and is trivial. The secondary fire no longer requires that it is held down for at least half a second. Upon releasing a charged shot, though, the gun cannot be fired in either mode for half a second. Charged shots now only need to charge for three seconds. The gun cannot overcharge. The primary fire can be used to release a charged shot as opposed to just releasing the secondary fire. This was intentional and seems to not have any side effects. The primary fire now does 15 damage. The secondary fire also does 15 if on minimum charge, though even a small tap will probably actually do 16 to 18. At full charge, it does 250. The damage done by a charged shot can be calculated with this formula. X is the duration of the charge. The primary fire's DPS is 75. The secondary fire's DPS is 30 with minimum charge shots and 83.3 repeating with full charge not including the half second fire delay and 71.4 with. Highway 17 and the driving part of sand traps only have relatively weak enemies. Antlions have 30 health so they take only 2 primary hits to kill. It takes just under 0.2 seconds of charging for a secondary shot to do 30 damage, aka it's the same either way. Combine soldiers have 50 health, so they take 4 primary shots to kill, which is 0.6 seconds, and only need 0.45 seconds of charging to kill. The primary fire is technically a bullet, which does not mean much, but is a weird fact. It can be off target by up to 1 degree. The damage type is shock for both modes and the penetration explosion. The secondary fire is a simple line trace like before. The beam is only capable of penetrating the world. Not even something boring like a door can be penetrated. To test if the beam can penetrate, a second line is drawn from 48 units ahead of the point of impact back to the point of impact. If the entire line was in solid material, then it won't penetrate, otherwise it will. 
beam damage plays no role in determining if the beam penetrates. The explosion on the other side of the wall will do damage equal to however much the beam would have done if it hit some other thing. The radius will always be 200. Combine soldiers therefore die instantly if they're within 160 units of the explosion if it's a full charge shot. Since displacements are only solid from one side, the explosion can hit the player or any other nearby thing if you shoot a displacement. The beam does not continue to go forward after penetrating. Many tricks were only possible due to very specific failures in the original beam behavior, so they're not possible in Half-Life 2. Funk Pushable is not used anywhere in Half-Life 2, and even if it was, no interesting effects would exist. Quick Goss and Rapid Fire are not possible due to better programmering. And that's the Tau Cannon I Goss.